cloud. All right, so welcome to the Augur 8 Knot meeting uh, for February 19th. Um, I've shared the notes in the chat and I will now share them on my screen. Uh, if you could, you could put your names in there if you want to. <clears throat> oh, I meant to put a different question in there. Um, so I guess uh, we'll just use last week's. We'll answer that. Yeah. You should be excited about something different this week. Yeah. Skiing. It's still yeah. snow. What is that? You still have snow? Yeah, I travel a lot for skiing. This is what I enjoy doing. I just actually flew out to the west coast of the United States for there's a lot of like good mountains over here. And so I'm working remote and then doing and skiing and I'll take some time off later this week. Nice. Uh, I don't know nice. if Rigsley is a word. Yeah, yeah, I guess it is. So, okay, so I'll get started. So last week uh, we did have a brief discussion about Docker and a RabbitMQ container and Gary issued a pull request that got that up and running. Um, I noticed when I ran our Docker container that I need to update the schema script that gets generated within it so that it follows our regular standards. So I'm taking that as an action item um, as a follow-up to last week. And since Gary isn't here this week, we'll just uh, go forward with um, the thing that we I really kind of wanted to spend some time on today is the... Um, Hey, Hamed, uh, getting a lot of background noise there. Can you hear us okay? Mute. Trying to mute you. There we go. Okay. So we wanted to talk about the interaction design process and iterating the user experience. And to set that up, I can reflect on some of the things we talked about last week. And unfortunately, we have a largely different group this week. So without spending a lot of time reviewing it, I would say that um, one of the th that people experience when they go to here is it's it's um, not immediately obvious how to get other things. So like if I'm interested in the Kubernetes project, I have to know to... Um, click that project and search for it. Yeah, it seems like people don't know it's a search. Like I've, I've had more questions like where it's like, oh, this is a search bar and having to explain that than I would have ever imagined. And I'll also kind of put the preface that like James and I are the ones that end up designing this and we are engineers and not designers and are in like any critique, any suggestion, any things that like you will not hurt our feelings. We are, <laughs> this is not our skill set. We've made this usable and now we want to make it actually like user friendly and hmm. all that. Good stuff. Yeah, something is wrong. Um, it might not be wrong. It might actually just be an empty report. Like there's a lot of times there's just like, especially in a project like Kubernetes, they'll have like 50, like 50 to 100 repositories. And a lot of times they are just like, Oh, I'm on Dio. Now yeah. I see what the problem is. I'm on Dio Kubernetes. Oh, uh, oh uh, then that's probably a fork. That's a hundred percent a fork. Yeah. And another thing that I'll say on that, <laughs> on the note of looking at the search bar and then, um, not seeing stuff and knowing needing to know to go look up Kubernetes. That's a fix that we're big in soon where when you click on the search bar, it'll mm -hmm. show like a huge list of available repos that are kind of prompting that you should, if you want something specific, you should, can type it into the bar. Um, and then the other idea that is currently being worked on is having like a, repos orgs and your user groups search interface like mm -hmm. as separate things which will do two things it'll 
make it clearer what is a note what is ultimately going to be in the drop down list of options mm -hmm. and it'll hopefully dissuade users from the path of just looking up an entire org at once mm -hmm. um, because then we can gate it with a little message that says orgs are very big uh if they're if it, if you pick enough big orgs uh, we can't guarantee that your request will work as intended. Yeah. So yeah, I would say that we talked really about feedback. that being a yeah talked about it being a toggle, but we're open to any of the things. And I would say yeah. honestly, from doing the analysis side, I also want to push people to not do orgs just because the analysis isn't as rich. Most of the time, there's like one or two, maybe three repositories in these orgs that really hold the like plethora of the information and then once you add a lot of the rest of them they can add a lot of noise that isn't yeah. actually like how you're seeing with that repos that random repository there's no like it's not as rich and can get to be confusing um i would say that in a lot of my own analysis i have gone from looking at orgs almost at all to be to looking at specific repositories and that's pretty different than what i was doing a year ago that's good. That's good insight. So one of the one of the things I want to do here is um, what we. So those are some things that we know are happening with eight knot. We've got Hamed and Lami here, who I think are you both designers. Yes. So, um, when you, I mean, I guess one question I have is what would be a process that we could follow to iterate the user experience, like from a designer's perspective, how do we go about um, thinking about the interaction space around Augur and 8 Knot in a way that leads us towards it being easier for people to use by just looking at it? So I'm not asking you for that solution. I'm just like, what kind of process can we start moving down the road of in your experience? Uh, okay. For now, I'm thinking I don't have a lot of context on the project yet. So yeah. my first understand the information architecture. So know how information goes from one page or one section to another. And then to understand maybe the major actions you want users to take or the major actions that users actually take. Hmm. And problems that users face. I know that you've listed a few ones about the search bar, people not knowing like the search bar or having to impute specific queries, which they may not have. So problems like that, we need to know so that we can address it while creating a new design. Um, on the, like how the architecture works, there's actually a page on 8Knot. If you go back to the 8Knot page and go to welcome, um, and then you go to how eight knot works. This explains it at a really more <laughs> in-depth level. And so honestly getting feedback of being like, if the, if the feedback is looking at this, this tells us nothing about like, we can't, we don't really understand what's happening. Um, that's good too, because we need, like we want to have that information on the site for people can learn about how it works. And if what we have right now isn't actually giving that information, that'd be good to know. And I'd also be curious, James, I know we have some resources uh, available that explain it more and also, more and also in a more like in a, maybe in a more simplistic way as well, where it's the biggest thing to kind of think about with the eight knot instance is that this pretty much just plugs directly into an auger database. Mm -hmm. And so the search bar is just querying the Augur database for those for the repo IDs of that specific of those specific um, either um, repos or organizations. And then the visualizations are populated by the Augur data that is associated with that um, repository. So like the pull request ones, you take the search bar and get the repo IDs and then we we search on the um like pull request tables for context and that's how the visualizations are populated it's pretty much just a like plug and play 
or like a front end on top of auger. Yeah, from the look of things, I should say, things here are so placed everywhere. I really didn't expect to find like uh, how it works, logging into auger, creating project groups like down here, because mm -hmm. um, from a UX perspective, uh, from a user experience perspective, like you'd expect the menus to be on the uh, on the header section, like the nav navigation bar up here. So, um, I I I want to I want to say that um, if um if if this is going to really like change, probably you should also you should also have. Um, an idea about what things you want to stay in place. For example, um, there could be like a total overhaul of everything, or probably you want to just change some sections and you want to keep some sections the way they are, or some data, visual, data visualizations the way they are. So are there things that you'd want to keep the way they are? Or if someone says, okay, guys, we're putting all this down and we're building something else, you'd be okay with that. If they said I, that they wanted to just tear tear down the styling and where things are on the page, and there was a reasonable rationale for that, mm -hmm. I would feel very comfortable with that. Minus um, subdividing the visualizations into pages. Mm -hmm. um, that's the only thing where, like, we're trying to group them together logically. Mm -hmm. I don't really care whether it's like one at a time or two by however many but like i think that a logical grouping of visualizations is the only thing other than that if someone said like search bar needs to be centered and bigger and you know such and such thing that would be totally cool with me we really just yeah. want the guidance yeah, yeah because... the only other mm -hmm. okay go ahead though um, the only other thing I would add to that is the card structure that we have going for the, if we go over type the visualizations, the repo overview, I don't think it's a good example of this, but like how they're sectioned into little boxes. This is like, if you look at the coding side of it, like each one of the visualizations is its own file with its own filtering, like all of the filters are it's all like grouped together. And so that makes it a lot easier to develop. And so that's kind of the, would be the major, most of the stuff is like the architecture on the backside is the stuff that I feel really, I wouldn't, I would be a little bit more hesitant to change stuff mm -hmm. on the, how that is displayed on the front end. I really don't have too much care about it. Absolutely. Okay. Um, uh, I'm sure um, Lamy, Lamy um, has less context about all these. And um, I usually join the designers meetings that happen on Wednesdays. Um, that's why probably I'm asking, I'm also an engineer. I'm not like uh, a designer, <laughs> but I'm so in touch with the designers of the chaos community. So I'm asking all these questions just to make sure I'm not having poison <laughs> to give to them. Um, and also probably for Lamy to get more context. Um, Sean, if you would just go back to the metrics. Yeah, so what I understand is um, the nav bar up here is um, options for kind of um, visualizations. Hmm. And um, yeah, these so these all take you to different visualizations that are classified like these, this is contributors' behavior. All right. Mm. All right. And, and, and then if you could just go back to welcome. Welcome. So what about this that is below here, like where you, um, you're having um, using eight node visualization, how eight node works, logging into Argor, creating projects. Yeah, that down there. How'd you get? So the, the one thing I, like the one, Thing I think that people struggle with is being greeted by a search bar mm -hmm. um, on the public instance because it doesn't give them any sense of what their what the scope of the data is like what can they look at yeah. mm -hmm. and and so from a user experience perspective if there was a a page that 
made it more clear that there were lots of different things in the database that people could look at. Um, and that, what are those things on this page? So they're not on this page. No. So you, you wouldn't know that there's like 60,000 repositories behind this search bar. Okay. You, you would have no idea. So, right. so thing one so, would be something to give them a sense of the search space. That's a really good thought. I wonder if we could just like when we load the application, mm -hmm. we could just have one check that says how many individual, how many GitHub URLs are there in the database or something? How many mm -hmm. URLs, how many orgs? And then like just populate a literal count. Yeah. Like select from one of, or select among. Okay. Um, but, well, the designers will say so, but um, if you have like um, a thousand repos, um, the best way to sh tell people that you have a thousand repos is by giving them a number, but you can't like list a thousand repos and tell them to select. Probably the search bar would come in handy and then it will tell you whether the repo is in or it's not in, but there is no way on a UI you could represent a thousand repos. I mean, that would take a lot of scrolling to go through the thousand repos. So, oh yeah, I'm just talking about the number. And then in the search bar, you can pick however many, but by having um, by having a count, like Sean says, of just like, oh, there are under repo like list. That. I'm seeing like repo list next to search help repo list. It just tells you what pot was pop actually populated oh. into the search bar because that was getting confusing for some people. Like, so then if you have the organization in there, also people were putting things in the search bar and not pressing search. Okay. And so, and I'd say also a lot of it has to, like, I use that more a lot on the development side whenever to know whether things are like some we've had like problems with this ever being honest like we've had problems with the search bar in the past and so the repo list is like a good like logical check mark where i'm like okay i'm for sure know that all of the chaos repos are is what's populating it or i know that it didn't get updated or if somebody's having issues there's been definitely some times where they're like oh this isn't in there or this doesn't look right and then we look at the repo list and it's because it hasn't been actually searched on. So like, yeah, so this is a good example. So I think I think the best way we can approach this probably um, since um, one party has more context and the other party has more experience in the design is by probably starting out on um, a design kind of thing we can start like um, deliberating about um, because if we do not start like having a visualization of where we want to put the stuff, we may not reach a conclusion of what really works and what doesn't work. So I do not know whether Lamy has something to say, but I'm just thinking um, there are always like designer meetings on Wednesdays. We can't, I, I, I'm going to make sure I attend those meetings and interest people in this project and probably on every Mondays, I don't know for how long, at least um, if we come up with something that looks like an overhaul, we can start a conversation about um, the placement so that uh, we get this moving without the designers knowing a lot of um, the engineering stuff and without the engineers getting into the design stuff too much, but just getting together by the visualization of it. I'm yeah, sorry. and then if there's any meetings or those meetings that would be useful for either James and I to go, just let us know. Yeah, let uh, me just check this. Yeah. Was Sean asking something? Mm -hmm. No, go ahead. Keep going. No, um, I, I was just saying how we can start this because um for one, the designers get the code and also the engineers get the design. So <laughs> something that can get us together is the is the designer saying, okay, this is what I have. Where, what did I do wrong? Or what do you expect? And do you think everything is where it should be? And then we could get started with that conversation that, oh, I think um, this should be here, or this looks good, something like that. So Lami and Hamed, listening to what we've all talked about right now, um, Lami, you kind of laid out, basically talk about information and going from one page to the other. 
major actions, problems. We've kind of gone over that a little bit. Um, from a process perspective, what do you suggest that we go through? Uh, because obviously, I don't think we're going to solve this in one one discussion. Yeah. Um, maybe help us get to a starting place. Yeah, I, I agree with Enoch. We should have a meeting to first brainstorm, and it could be several, maybe two or three, to um just have like a clear picture of what the new direction is. And we have our meetings, our design meetings, I think bi-weekly. Uh, so I'm suggesting that we we don't just have um these are brainstorming sessions um bi-weekly also. We can have it weekly just to make things um go by faster. I mean, we can use this meeting as part of the brainstorming session. Like we can set aside like right now. I don't know if people are ready to brainstorm. I think. That's a good thing to do. James's hand is up. I wanted to say, um, as Callie alluded to in the beginning, um, we are not emotionally attached to the existing design. And so please feel free to re-envision this in the way that you think is the most user accessible and enjoyable to use and don't feel constrained by our, uh, by our existing design. Because the way that I think a like tech, technical back and forth with this application will go, and what I've hoped would end up happening is that someone with much better accessibility and design experience than we do can essentially say, this is what it might in the best case look like, and we will do our best to consider that design that template in consideration of the technical challenges that we would have to face in order to get it there and iterate back and forth on what is possible. Um, so agreeing on, you know, color palette, design specification, accessibility, having a, a mock-up of what it would look like and trying our best to fit the existing application to that design spec would probably be the least friction way to do things because we can be very mobile with, we can, we can be very flexible with what things look like. Um, you know, we, we're really just excited to be able to absorb some of your creative energy and get to put that into practice. So, you know, if you started from a green field and said like, you know, scratch everything that exists, given what we know this app kind of tends to do, this is what would probably look best and make the most sense. We can run with that and start iterating on that. So that's just the non-technical expectations I would put ahead. Like we're very flexible and willing to, you know, we're willing to 100% reorganize and rewrite if it means that we can bolster our accessibility and user experience and aesthetics. So um, I'm not sure uh, if, if I check on the chaos designers meeting, it's really not favorable for, for because here it's showing 4 a.m., which means it is also be 4 a.m. for Sean. I'm not sure what it will be for James and Kali, but for the people oh, in man. Africa, it's a really comfortable time for them. No, I'm but... thinking we can use this meeting time for this mm -hmm. design iteration work okay. because I think this is the place for it, unless anybody disagrees. Well, I'm not sure how many people would. Okay, my 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 problem is uh, the the number of designers that will be able to join this meeting compared to the number of designers that join the original designers meeting um that's my only bit but we don't need we, could... we don't need a thousand designers um we just need a couple to work with us yeah we could the use process these, yeah we could use these for the few designers and probably if there is a lot of stuff to work on they could propagate that to the other designers meeting and continue some of the stuff there that's what i'm thinking Okay. Um, 
So, I saw Hamed disappeared. We have Edith here now. Um, uh, okay, so Lami, you can bring it up during your regular design meetings. Is there a place that you would start with us, Lami? Like, um, what can we do to make you more familiar or help you to brainstorm um, here? Yeah, I was um, thinking of going through it on my own. I have um, a bit of more context now. So I would uh, just try to understand it on my own a bit, ask questions if any comes up, and then I can start discussing mm -hmm. it. And uh, would also like to hear from other designers that are here. Sorry, yeah. um, Edith and um, oh, Shield. Oh, there were well. more people. Oh. Yeah, Edith joined. I I don't I don't I guess uh Zoom yeah, Doreen is here now. Zoom loves cutting down the attendance. Um, so, uh, so for me, I think brainstorming would um would be better for me to start next um next yeah, week. Yeah, sure, sure. Next yeah. Take a little time to absorb what all this is first. Yeah, and 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 I and, and I'm not sure. Um, Sean, there are a lot of other subdomains for chaos. Um, apart from the metrics, probably. Um, I'm not trying to get things out of proportion, but could there be another design or Figma design for another chaos? Um, subdomain that would probably be good to benchmark on, or is there already uh, an established design language for some of the chaos subdomains that? You'd what do you mean by with? sub? What do you mean by subdomain? There is like I see metrics the chaos dot I see right. um bitage dot I O chaos dot bitage dot I O like so all those other subdomains. So I would look at. The thing we're designing around is Augur and Eight Knot, and what came up in the last meeting is that some people who have been doing open source metrics for a while like this one feature that's in Grimoire Lab, mm -hmm. and I don't think we need to replicate. Uh, so this feature, basically, here I have chaos. I haven't really selected chaos. That's just what this dashboard is. So it's a completely different model. But one of the things that you can do is um, add filters. And these filters can be all around a lot of things. Like it's an almost endless list of every field in the database. And um, I don't know that we need to replicate that. But people do like this. Uh, mm -hmm. Yeah, they like this, even though I can't really follow what it's supposed to do. People who have used Grimoire Lab for a while can. Yeah, I, I, I think I think things like these also give like a tone to Lamy and the rest of the people that probably may be working on this. Having uh having instances or designs they can benchmark on, that designs that speak to what you you would really, um, some of the things you really want to see in the website. So if they're like um. Uh, visualizations or already deployed um, instances of visualizations, even if it's like from other um, websites, probably they can give the design team a context to, okay, they expect something like this or something like this or this functionality, the way it is here, things like that. Yeah. I, yeah. So I'm not sure I, I am not the best representative of what this is supposed to be. But it's this adding filters, so maybe you could filter by it looks like a person or issues. Um, by other fault. Like I have no idea what that's going to do, <laughs> other than remove all results. So, but there is there is um, I don't know. This was put up last time as an example, so I don't think we're trying to design that. We're I just wanted to highlight that people do like, like to filter on different things. And I think we just have to think about what really makes sense um, to let people filter on. Right. Since the you know, I don't, I don't know that we, 
So I suppose like the idea of, okay, I've got HHS and then that appears down here um, as a filter. Like, I guess that UI tick would be something that people would like so they could just keep searching on different things. Um, um, Kali had like a comment. In okay. This, and also Dory in the chat section. Okay. Yeah, go for it. No, I, I mean... Okay. Yeah. Okay. okay. I can. I can. Yeah. I can talk about it. I mean, it's a little bit of a sidebar from what we're talking about right now, and I don't want to distract from the oh, conversation. Okay. Okay. But I think that the confusion of the different sites is becoming like a bigger and bigger deal. Like yeah. even the matrix.chaos.io versus the eight not the like R instance of it. Oh, um, this looks and so similar. Exactly yeah, it's just different, different data. Much, there's just different data in it, and it's ran slightly differently. So the problems there's like we've been getting issues on eight knot um, repo that have been specific towards the like public the metrics. The, 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 I mean, they're both public instances, and we both yeah, describe yeah, yeah. them as public yeah. instances, and that's where I think people are getting confused. And there's some stuff that James has done to our instance that has made it like some of the issues that are happening on the chaos instance. Are like fixed. They'll, yeah, where they're not a problem. And then, and so I just want to make sure, figuring out how we can specify the differences between the different instances or the like. And it seems like there's even more links that are different than I even knew about than just these two. Yeah. And knowing where we should be pointing people to open issues or how to communicate the problems um, for them to get to the correct parties. So uh, the the chaos dot or the metrics that chaos that I was creating some conflation and confusion. Yeah, I mean, they're but I, I wouldn't say that it's one set specifically causing the problem over the other. It's just the the existence of both, and it's like we, like Sean, you like the two of us understand the difference between the two, but it anybody else, I mean, it gets it'll get confused, it gets confusing very quickly, um, and so and it, like I said, it seems like there's other like URLs that are in the mix of confusion as well. Do you have any suggestions on what we might do to? mitigate that like i'm open to anything really i don't want to create confusion i think that's bad I yeah think, like in yeah, i'm thinking of other applications that are open source projects that are deployed for different people like discourse is a common example and they um they have like different titles on pay or they have like an obvious customization that says like, this is the Ansible discourse, or this is the, um, you know, Augur, you know, whatever, um, or Dash. Point being, if we had some kind of customizability thing that says this instance is this, or a different color even, um, with a note that says like, who is currently running the instance, I feel like that would be, well on the way to being sufficiently clear without being like too heavy handed about it. Like, I don't think this is a, like an irreparable issue in the slightest. Like I'm kind of expecting that, you know, you like, I want it to be the case that you can run an instance that is wholly independent from ours. It's just as valid. You know, the database is, the data sources should be federated, should be individual um, as necessary. So it shouldn't be something that's easily confused. And as a result, like we should expect that these things are run separately um, on different data. So we can think about what that actually looks like and how we can maybe add like a panel at the top that says, you know, hypothetically, owned and operated by chaos project owned and operated by red hat something like that i don't know that's all yeah. just like totally yeah, random it's... but that's kind of the, the vibe of what i'm thinking no it's not random i think i think it would be helpful if people knew which yeah. uh you know we're able to see clearly which 
instance they're on because i know at least one friend of mine has had confusion and actually been yeah. using both instances and created accounts on both instances and yeah <laughs> i think i think um gitlab um gitlab instances have a way for if you if, if you if you're an, an instance like um you you can tell which instance you're on because you have to put like a logo on your top left mm. of the of the page and then also after the logo it shows what organization that is logo is like a really good top idea. On, the, on the and you could they have like modifications you can do for your own like to customize your your web page or your instance and you could easily tell if you're if you're if you're if you're like on the so most mostly I use the Debian instance. If you're like on Debian, you can tell that this is GitLab, but it's a Debian instance, or this is GitLab, but it's a Chaos instance. This is same UI, but you can easily tell by the the custom the customization. So I guess we could come up with something like that in the UI where the instance is determined by something in the in the welcome section. I don't know how many other instances they are <laughs> apart from these two. These two are the ones right now, but I expect okay. that will change and grow. All right. And um, mm -hmm. that would also call for something like a, a template or, yeah, I don't want to say a template, but something like that, because if you're saying they will grow, they should be like a, customize, a template to to show how you can customize your your instance. Another equivalent might be how, or something spiritually similar is how Jira separates out logical spaces, because okay. I know they do. Um, so what we could do is like, because I think this is this is a relatively simple design thing to solve. So it's worth mm. just going at going for it. Like exactly like you said, like having a. Um, having a logo that needs to be applied. Like right yeah. now we use the eight knot logo, yeah. but perhaps it would make sense for like Sean's yeah, to have a like um, an embedded like chaos logo with a little eight knot in the corner or something. Uh -huh. And we could like essentially do that with CSS where if someone applies like the non-standard logo, it also puts a little eight knot logo in the bottom corner of that image or something. Um, and then it would be super clear. Okay. This, it would be in the top left too. Like this is not the same one because there's a different logo in the same place. I think that would make a lot of sense. Yeah. A lot more clarifying. Oh, there are a lot of things to a lot of action items here, Sean. Yeah. <laughs> the document is growing. Yeah. I think that's good. Hugely useful though. Yeah. I'm just just like how how are you going to keep track of these? <laughs> I mean, I think I think um the action items are I think um at least Lamy and maybe Doreen and Hamed can go away and sort of think about the design space here and we can talk about a process. Um more of a process next time mm -hmm. next week uh, sure. and um maybe it sounds like james is already thinking about this declarative how to address this issue i mean not yeah. that issue um this this issue <laughs> about the two different public instances yeah. yeah the only thing that i'm thinking sean is if um that might also need to be mirrored to the back end because what our mutual friend was having trouble with was that she had an account in both spaces yeah I and know. it's like an auger this is like one of those confusing things like an individual auger instance doesn't look any can different serve multiple front ends that's true um so you could have three dash apps where Two of it's them are served by the same auger front end. So right now and I have right now it's a one-to-one -one mapping. 
Is it strictly? Oh, you mean like the current state of things? Yeah. But that's not a requirement. Because I could go create... Well, right now it's literally not because I have my personal development instance linked to the same Padres front yeah. end. You, yeah, so you can do that. But we don't... I don't... I have not deployed any multiple instances of eight not against a single instance of auger right because i think that would get confusing in a hurry but i think that's that's not an invalid path people might choose to take yeah and in fact i wouldn't be surprised if like your students kind of did that kind of thing in the future like that's very possible. yeah yeah like when i taught the when i taught oh, he was eight not in my class last semester yeah they were all talking to one instance yeah. So I had like 12, so, and, but we didn't deploy any of that publicly. Yeah, but it could be a challenge. So if we can have the front end, like 8 not communicate with the back end front end. That's another thing. Like saying. the naming the naming convention is tricky. Um because Lom 8 not is also a front end for Augur, technically speaking, with its own back end. So mm -hmm. like maybe Augur portal or something. That's a good point. Lami, your hand is up. Yes. Um, I'm not sure I have a clear picture of what Jira's logical space look, looks oh. like. Can you explain or give an example of where to find it? Do you want yeah, to share? absolutely. Um, Do you want to show your so, screen, James? Or? Well, I don't currently have Jira, but I'll just tell you what I mean. Um, so are you familiar with what Jira is? Yes. So um, like inside of Red Hat, there are tons of subdomains of Jira for different teams that all track issues independently. But we use <clears throat> public facing Jira for uh, some communities. Like I know we do it for Ansible, which is an automation tool. So if someone wants to go log an issue with our company's um, uh, task management system for the project we run, they go talk to that version of Jira, that instance of Jira. Um, I can find it quickly. Um, I'm trying to. Good at mm -hmm. Ansible Jira. I don't know if I can find it super fast. Uh, point being that people at different companies also use Jira on their teams. So Jira as a software product looks relatively similar between projects. And the reason that people know which Jira they're currently working with is because I think you can affect some colors. You are, you know, you can read what project you're under. Um, and so taking those like design cues like just mm -hmm. you know our minimum viable difference would be color based because that's kind of the key that everybody expects um and label based so either different iconography in different places or um different literal text in different places um, like minimum requirement to differentiate between two simultaneously deployed applications would be different image, different text. Um, yeah, I'm poking around trying to get to Ansible, but not. I don't know why it's hard to find, but it is. Yeah. But the point, the point is like the same piece of software, the same code, run at different, run for different purposes by different administrations. Mm -hmm. should be differentiable by styling yeah um and very easily so um and it's not something that we made a first class consideration but it's something that we need to now make a first class consideration all right thanks it's clear enough yeah i'm sorry i wish i had a, a actual pragmatic example to show you but it's all like you have to go through multiple forums to get to what i'm trying to get to which is a problem in and of itself.
I will also try to find some. Mm -hmm. If I find it, I'll give it to you. Um, and I think um, we're about at the end of time. So let yeah, if if, uh, if you find any Jira instances that uh, work, just throw, throw it not channel. And here it is. One has to log in, but this is um, probably this is the Jira. So you just need a Red Hat account to go access it. But you can see that there's like the Red Hat logo, and that is obviously different from anybody else's Jira. So I, I have some ideas. Um, we I can in, I can put together a little suggestion of how we can do it. And, yeah, we should wrap up so we're sensitive to everybody's time. Yeah. All right. So we could log in here at another time. Yeah. And you create an account there. Thank you, everybody, for participating in the Augur A Not Design meeting today. I think uh good start to the discussion. And I'm really looking forward to working with Lami and Doreen and Hamid Ahmed. Uh, Absolutely. So thanks everybody. Thank you guys so much. Until next time. Appreciate it. Thank you. Take very good care. Thank you.